Hi there, and welcome to The D-Spot, a brand new vodcast and podcast series that is boldly redefining dyslexia. We're bringing together inspirational educators, industry disruptors, passionate change makers, many made by dyslexia. We give in-depth insight into dyslexic thinking and the vital role it will play across sectors and discuss why the world needs more of it right now. Inspiring, informative, surprising conversations set on creating change. I'm joined today by three leaders from three truly global organisations who are disruptors or transformers in their industry. They're also all partners of Made by Dyslexia and passionate about dyslexic thinking skills and cognitive diversity. We're going to start the conversation today based on the assumption that we're going to build on, on the EY knowledge and the reports that we did with EY on the value of dyslexia, that dyslexic thinking skills map directly across the skills for the future, according to the World Economic Forum. And we're also going to pick up on the new research that we're doing and why we need to move this issue forward very, very quickly. So uh, the first guest today is Karen Blackett, who is from WPP, a global creative transformation company. We're also joined by Steve Hatch, who is a VP at Facebook, and by Matt Higgs, who is from Manpower Group. So if I can just start by asking you to tell us just a little bit about um, who you are and what you do um, and what your organisation does. Um, Karen, can we start with you? Hi, look, thank you so much for inviting me on today and it's a pleasure to be part of this conversation. So, um, as you said, I work for WPP. Um, we are the largest marketing communications organisation globally. And I also wear another hat, which is running uh, the media investment arm of WPP in the UK. So. Essentially, we work with a number of clients and their brands to try and help their products and their organizations grow. So connecting consumers to their customers by looking at advertising campaigns, by looking at shopper marketing, by looking at all forms of connections to basically be able to purchase or buy a particular brand. So I have the pleasure of working with an Avengers Assemble of talent across WPP and creating and connecting that talent with our clients. And WPP um, agencies have worked with us from our launch, actually. Um, VML, YNR, we're working with currently, and YNR did our amazing sperm bank film. So um, it's fantastic to, to have the support of such an amazing organisation. Um, and Steve, I mean, obviously everybody knows Facebook, but tell us a little bit about um, you and what you do. Yeah, thanks, Ken. Great to be with everyone today. Well, I think the first thing I'd like to say is, is I'm I'm proudly dyslexic. You know, that's uh, it's certainly you know my personal experience. I I've, I've found that is represented, of course, challenges, but actually kind of huge opportunities and 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 benefits over time. And I'm kind of really glad that we're able to get into some of those things today. Uh, yeah, I look after Facebook for Northern Europe, so I'm normally based in London. Look after a team across Northern Europe, but also um. It's great to be uh, in London because it's our second largest engineering site, uh, outside, uh, actually second only to our HQ in MPK. So we're pretty big now uh, in the UK, about 5,000 people. And they're all working on a combination of roles, whether that's creating new products or new experiences across Facebook, Instagram, uh, WhatsApp, uh, also creating areas of kind of VR and AR, and also the really important aspects of safety and integrity. So whether that's creating kind of artificial intelligence to be able to help make sure that the content we don't want on the platform is removed, and often removed ahead of time, but also creating great innovation for businesses. And I'm also lucky enough to have worked extensively prior to joining Facebook seven years ago with Karen at WPP. So I know just what an amazing leader she is. And we're also proud to partner with WPP now on our current guys, because we're uh, half our business is advertising and our, and, our, and, our, and our focus as a company is on community. So we get to do lots and lots of work together. And talking about community, I mean, our Made by Dyslexia community was born on Facebook and is very, very active. So for us, working with you has been really amazing to build our community and, and spread our message around the world. And, and Matt, tell us a little bit about what you do at Manpower. Thank you, Kate. Hi, my name's uh, Matt Hicks. 
Kate said, and I work for Manpower Group Talent Solutions, and we're a global workforce solutions company that provides talent solutions and end-to-end data-driven capabilities across the entire talent life cycle. Um, we leverage um, a global expertise and have a strong understanding of talent and also really the market predominantly in looking at what's coming in the future and what the future is um, is going to hold. And I think what has happened in um, the last year has been um, a huge driver for change, really, in terms of what talent wants, what how organisations will approach talent. And I think from my personal point of view, whilst I'm, I'm personally not dyslexic, my son is. And I think this has driven a real passion inside of me into to use what I do in my job um, to really align what I see as something that is actually one of the key things to change the talent shortage um, in the future. And I'm really, really privileged to be on this panel. And Kate, Steve, Karen, thank you for thank, thank you for inviting me. Oh, thank you, Matt. Um, I'm excited to, to tell everybody what we're working on together and how we're going to be taking the assumptions from the EY report and looking at what that means in, in real life and how we actually move that forward. Karen, you're not dyslexic, but um, a huge percentage of people across WPP will be. I think every single team that we've worked with on WPP has had at least two or three dyslexics on it. Um, Tell me why you think dyslexic thinking skills are so vital for an organisation like yours. So look, I think the official stats, is it one in 10 people are dyslexic and I have 10,000 people at WPP in the UK. And I was really concerned actually last year when we went into lockdown and we went into, you know, this world of remote working and constantly on a screen about how we really ensure inclusion to make sure that everybody is able to contribute because my god we all needed to contribute last year to ensure that we survived and got to 2021 and look when i think about the work that we do at wpp I, i'm sort of renowned for being a broken record in my industry for saying that when we think about diversity and inclusion, it's not a problem to fix, but it's actually a solution and a solution to growth. And I genuinely mean that because I really believe that everyone has a superhero power and it's about how you bring those different superhero powers to work together as a team. And when it comes to dyslexia, and I think about the work that we do at WPP for brands and clients, we need people that have got amazing creativity we need people that have got critical thinking skills we need people that are brilliant at problem solving we need people who are amazing when it comes to visualization and all of that you see and some with people that have dyslexia and you know steve is the person on the call that um is dyslexic and i can categorically say that all of those skills sit in steve so it's incredibly important for me to ensure that you know those skills are needed as part of our everyday job for all of our clients and hence i want to make sure and need to make sure that anything that can be seen as an impairment from how we are working doesn't become an impairment due to our virtual world and that that cognitive assessment and analytical thinking and problem solving comes to the forefront and is part of all of our teams that work together across the business for our clients. It makes complete sense, doesn't it, for everybody to be playing to their strengths. Um, and, and that's a really vital thing for dyslexic people. Um, and statistically, we believe it's as many as one in five, um, which is a huge, it's 20% of every workforce, which is was a, a huge percentage, obviously. So Steve, you are famously made by dyslexia, as am I, I have to say. Um, and, and I know from working with you that you have got dyslexic thinking skills in abundance. And I would imagine across Facebook, being a media communication storytelling type of organisation, you must find that you have a big percentage of dyslexic people in the organisation. Yeah, I mean, I, I find it really interesting, like every meeting, every time the topic comes up, either 
in the meeting or after the meeting, you know, you'll get a message from someone who says, oh, I'm really glad you spoke about that today because I'm dyslexic. And, I, and that says a couple of things to me, you know, one, we're always underestimating the number of people for whom this is, this is true. And that there's always more work to do to ensure that people feel that they are able to be kind of open and included and being able to bring their, their full selves to work. And uh, there's, you know, when you've got an organization, you know, like Facebook, which is looking to service the needs of communities around the world and, and literally billions of people, do you want to have a, 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 the people in your team sort of representing as much as you possibly can, all of that diversity that, that um, that's there. So um, I'm, I have a particular role in this, which is I am the exec sponsor for the differently abled, what we call FBRG, so Facebook resource group. So we have a number of like incredibly powerful and brilliant groups of, of different types of communities within our own, uh, within our own organization. And it's it, it's a good example of where where you where you start to build inclusion on on any aspect of how somebody is identifying themselves. It's just better for everyone because you end up with a more empathetic, a more open workplace, a place where people can be themselves. And and then also hearing specifically communities when they need specific needs. So whether that's uh, um, okay, what are we using in our tools that enable dyslexic fonts or how are we thinking about our review processes, for example, that mean that they can be as neuro-inclusive as they are perhaps for some of the other areas of inclusion that we've spent a bit longer um, on as an organization. So I'm, I, I feel great to see the, the kind of openness that people are demonstrating. And I think also the, the passion that, that, that people have. And, you know, I'm also really grateful to my team as well, because I am very open with them and saying, look, if it doesn't always, if I've written something, and it doesn't always make sense. Like maybe sometimes it just doesn't make sense and it's a bad idea, but maybe I just haven't, you know, put something in the right place. So like, please, please, please let me know. And I think, uh, you know, when you have a position of leadership in that, to be able to demonstrate that is helpful. It's helpful for everyone. And, you know, Kate, as, as you know, at the bottom of my email signature, it says, you know, made by dyslexia, uh, hashtag made by dyslexia. And I, and I do have a line that says, you know, I'm dyslexic, apologies for any typos. I guess I look forward to a day where, where I maybe don't have to put that apology in front of that, um, but I do uh, um, currently. And it's incredible to me how many times, particularly I would say kind of outside of the UK, I've had replies from people saying, thanks so much for seeing that, you know, my son, my daughter, I am others. And I think, you know, just being able to create normalization and a celebration of those skills uh, um, is a passion area for me and we see it happening uh, I see and we see the benefits every single day in the work that we're doing yeah we'll come on to the the people talking about their dyslexia a little bit later because it's one of the big barriers that we're finding and just on that point we've got some new email lines that we're about to release soon and one of them is expect creative thinking and creative spelling so that's a that's a better one than sorry you excuse the typos so we've I got a whole that. series I love that. that's that's brilliant. Brilliant. That is absolutely <laughs> yeah so we've got some good ones um and Matt, uh, I know you're not dyslexic. You've, you've talked about your son and I know it's an area that you're very passionate about. This sounds like it could be a really good um, point to bring in the work that we're doing together. Yes. Um, and yeah. I know that, that what we're finding and what you believe is that dyslexia shouldn't just be in the diversity and inclusion um, area, it should also be in talent too. So would you like to tell everybody a little bit about what we're looking at doing together? Yes, thank you, Kate. No, I, I think I'm 100% I'm behind the, the fact that I think dyslexia is a talent. I've spent 20 years working in talent resourcing and, and recruitment, and we've constantly been in one industry or another in a skills shortage or a talent shortage. Um, and I think the pandemic has driven changes in, in how organizations are going to resource. And, and I think some of the work um, that we're doing with, with Made by Dyslexia links in with work and research that as an organization, Manpower Group has done. And we do a piece of work called the Skills Revolution. Um, and at the end of last year, we did a piece of work called the Skills Revolution Reboot, the three R's, renew, reskill and redeploy. What that has really highlighted is the trends and impact of COVID on the digitization 
and the future of jobs. But the most important thing is how important the development of soft skills will be. And linking to Karen's point and also to, to what Steve said, the organisations that recognise innovative solutions in the new normal, as in the new skills revolution, and finally a roadmap for those organisations will be the new work order. And we genuinely believe that. And I think that's something that we're working really closely with, with, with Kate on. Um, just to give you some sort of st some statistics around this, we, we've surveyed 26,000 employees across 40 countries across the world, and companies are accelerating their digitization and automization as a result of the pandemic. So that's, and that number is 38% of those companies are doing that. These are numbers we've never seen before, and I'm sure as two leaders in major organizations you may see, may, may see a similar thing but the most the other standout statistic is 86 percent of employers that are automating plan to increase their headcount and that headcount is already on a headcount that they're struggling to fill so companies that are digitizing most and creating the most jobs and require employees with strong soft skills to complement the adoption of that technology create a thriving future in our mind. So that is soft skills plus the tech, tech skills, and that equals human power. And everything, I, as I listen more and more to, to, to Kate and the work that Made by Dyslexia do, to me, that is ticking the boxes. So you read the EY reports, you look at where the gaps in talent are, and dyslexic thinking and dyslexic behaviours tick a lot of those boxes. And I think for me as a passionate person within talent acquisition and also a father, I see it as a, a to me, it, it, it's, um, I hate using this, this strat line, but it's no, a no brainer for people. And I'm, I'm right behind it. The amazing thing is we have a skills gap. We have a world that is changing dramatically. And I know there's some statistics that um, by 2025, 50% of the work that is done um, in the world will be done by machines and the other 50% uh, need the soft skills and the human skills that are very largely made by dyslexia. So um, and it's an amazingly exciting time to be dyslexic because we've been the underdogs through education and the recruitment process for most of our lives and suddenly the world needs us. So it's very exciting. But actually, how do we make that a reality? Because you've said, Matt, there is a skills gap and employers are not looking for dyslexic people because they're putting up barriers that's with psychometric testing and things. Um, obviously, it's Facebook and WPP, you're, you're not putting up those barriers because you're, you're recruiting and you're supporting in a very different way, which is recognizing cognitive diversity and supporting creative thinking. What do you think you're doing right as an organization and what could you share with other organizations that would be listening to this? Karen, let's start with you and WPP. I genuinely think we have to look at how we recruit and look at the structures and the processes for recruitment because they have been traditional. They really have been traditional. And in order for us to uh, ensure that we are getting the very best talent through the door, recognising the skills gap that we have. We can't look at age old ways of recruiting and the structures and the processes that we have and expect a different outcome. So, you know, the, the, to your point, Kate, you know, doing everything around covering letters, CVs, written presentations, psychometric tests, it's a very formulaic, old school, traditional way of doing things. And we have to be better than that. Um, and I'm not saying that, you know, we change the processes in order to drop the quality. Far from it. That is not what I'm saying at all. We change the processes to allow more talent to be recognised and come through the door. So more conversations, more scenarios where we workshop things rather than written old school assessments, which is the way that so many big corporates um, tend to recruit talent. So I think a real focus on our systems and processes for talent attraction and really thinking about how we get people to be seen at their best and how as managers we assess. So training for managers as well who are doing the recruitment, I think is where we focus. 
And I think also with, with something like WPP, because you've got a lot of creative um, companies, the way that somebody would present themselves and apply for a job in a creative industry is to just showcase the things that they're very, very good at. So, you know, that's that's a perfect way of recruiting, really, rather than trying to squeeze everybody into standardized tests. And and Steve, what are Facebook doing to recruit and support their dyslexic people? We have a benefit here, which I, I, I value enormously as a dyslexic, but I think it's true for everybody that works at Facebook, which is our philosophy is one of playing to strengths. So encouraging people to use the innate abilities that they have, and that's where our emphasis is, versus other things that they might not be as good at or might not enjoy as much. So that's the background that sits behind all of the other decisions that we make. And then the next part of that is just being very, very intentional. And we have a three pillar approach, a find, grow and keep. So how do we go and find the best talent? And you know, some of that means that we are making sure we are out in the marketplace, holding events, inviting people that are neurodiverse to those events so that they would consider us as an employer. So the uh, I have my list of folks that don't work at Facebook that I would love to work at Facebook. And I know uh, many of us have. And then grow, which is really examining our principles and our processes. You know, are they dyslexic friendly? Are they, yeah, are they too emphasis? Do we have too much emphasis potentially on text versus other ways of people being able to describe an input on their performance? And actually, what's interesting is if you focus on dyslexia, you also find that there's a sub benefit as well that where people don't necessarily have English as their first language, we have an incredibly kind of international. Uh, uh, um, kind of mix of, of folks at Facebook, as you as you can imagine, amongst the sixty five thousand people, that's but a side benefit. So sometimes, like aiming for inclusion for one group, really helps on another problem as well. So find, grow, support them, make sure people are nurtured, they're able to be assessed and and, and, and supported in the right way in their managers, and then keep. So celebrating those people, celebrating the kind of skills that they have, and ensuring that that recognition is there because. There's no point in doing all that great work and getting the best people into your organization if you then lose them. So find, grow and keep as the approach being super intentional and making sure that always, always, always we're emphasizing the play to strengths. And we know just how clear the, the strengths of dyslexics are. There's a huge amount of work, isn't there, to, to do to influence education as well. And that's something we're we're trying very hard to do. There's a great movement building around that at the moment because it is, uh, in most countries across the world, but particularly in the UK, it is about knowledge-based education, as you say. And it's not about, you know, Google has all the knowledge you could ever possibly want. It's what you do with that knowledge that um, the workforce is really needing to, to hire. Matt, how, how would you um, say... Uh, manpower is or, or the organizations you're working with are doing with dyslexia and what do you think needs to to change and I, and I know we're looking at that together to see what we can do to move the agenda forward I, I first Kate I think quite I, as both um, Karen and Steve said I think a lot needs to change firstly and I don't think it's a single thing I think one of the things to look at I think Karen mentioned is is how you assess people I think you, most companies are stuck in assessment techniques from 20, 30 years ago, and, and they're, they're not changing. I think things we're hearing from organizations is employers are telling us that soft skills are very hard to find and difficult to develop, but they need them. 38% of organizations are saying it's difficult to train in demand skills, and it's even harder to teach tough, soft skills that they're asking for. So I think some of the things that, that we're doing and some of the things we're working with Kate with are how do we design assessments that really help people identify their strengths and work preferences. Um, and that's helping organizations find people that are fit for the role. Um, one, of the, one of the ways that we're looking at assessments is employing something called the, the, the LAD model, which is an assessment based on likability, ability and drive. And that really is, a, is a, the type of assessment that really plays to dyslexic thinking and the strengths of, di of dyslexics. In, so, but I don't think it's that one thing. I, I think um, last year we saw the biggest ever shift in the workforce and, and reallocation of skills. And what we're seeing is what we're seeing is a K-shaped recovery. We've never seen it before where the on-demand, the in-demand skills are even more challenging to find 
and are growing and growing and growing. And the skills that weren't in demand before are quickly disappearing due to automation, digitization, that sort of thing. And I think as this recovery changes and it's, it becomes a two-speed recovery, we're going to see industries bouncing back faster and better than ever, but it's how they then bring and reallocate these this resource. And I think this is genuinely, and I mean that genuinely the opportunity to, to grasp and change and I think the organizations like WPP and Facebook that are at the forefront of it will get access to that talent quicker, faster than, but the rest, everybody needs to embrace this because the recruitment industry works in numbers. Okay. So Kate just said one in five people in the world are dyslexic. So work that out as a talent community or as a database of people that should be filling jobs that are left unfilled for months, years. To me, it's just a, a fantastic opportunity to make that change now. I, can so, I just jump in? I love that. I love the idea of LAD. I've just written that down because I love the idea of likability, ability and drive. I think that's amazing. And just listening to you talk, actually, we need to sort of rebrand soft skills because it almost sounds as though they're not as important, isn't it? So that we need to do a rebranding of the term soft skills because they are equally if not more important uh, than somebody's ability elsewhere and it's just the whole phrasing of soft skills for me is an issue because it's so important sorry kate I had to jump in there no 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 i completely 100 percent agree and i think that also brings me to the point of we need to redefine dyslexia because dyslexia and we can't change the name for it which is something i would dearly love to do um, but it's obviously the way people actually can access support um, but it does need redefining and we do need to be looking at dyslexia and understanding it as a world both in education and in employment as a different and very valuable way of processing information um, I'm an organisation like GCHQ, uh, they have um, a, an apprenticeship scheme and um, the apprentices on the scheme are four times more likely to be dyslexic than in any other apprenticeship scheme. And they are actively recruiting people who are dyslexic because they're keeping our country safe. They have a very different way of recruiting. So, and they've been doing that since they started a hundred years ago. So you know we know what needs to happen we know it's it really is a no-brainer this is about asking people what their strengths are what their talents are getting them to be open and honest about being dyslexic which you know 76 percent of dyslexic people hide their dyslexic dyslexia from their employers because they're embarrassed about it that has to stop because we do have the skills that we need for the future so um i think from our perspective and I'll, I'll close now because we're running short on our time. But if there was one thing that we could do uh, and we would like the world to know, it is that dyslexia is not a disability. It's a really brilliant way of thinking. And we need to focus on our strengths and support our challenges. And, and we would love that to be something that the world of work and the world of education and parents and dyslexics around the world know. And that's our mission. And we're working on doing that with campaigns and other things. Um, if we can start with you, Matt, if there was one thing you want the world to know about this issue about dyslexia, what would it be or, or to change? What would it be? I think for me, it's um, there's many things, but I think the most the biggest thing is that uh, dyslexia is a talent first and foremost, and it's a talent that needs to be recognized uh, as something that can make a fundamental shift in how organizations recruit and solve the skill shortage across the world. And Karen, what would your one thing be? But I think it was what I said at the very beginning, that it's not a problem to fix or a disability, but a solution for growth. And post-COVID needed even more now than ever. So solution for growth. Awesome. And Steve, last word to you. Yeah, well, I'd say for dyslexic parents, for dyslexic employees, for dyslexic children, for all dyslexics around the world, and, and those are allies in this area. Just remember one thing, you've got a brain that's wired for the 21st century. You know, that is an incredible, incredible superpower.
Fantastic. Thank you so much. And be sure to check out the other D-Spot episodes and also the research that we're going to be releasing with Manpower very soon. Thank you so much, everybody. Great to talk to you. Thank you.